guest, Dr. Benjamin Carson. Now, Dr. Carson is a professor and director of the pediatric neurosurgery at the John Hopkins Medical Institution in Baltimore, Maryland. He became world-renowned in 1987 for leading a medical team in the first separation of Siamese twins who were joined at the back of the head. Both survived. He also led the first completely successful separation of vertically joined twins in 1997. He holds numerous honors and awards, including more than 20 honorary doctor degrees. Please welcome with me to the Christ Cathedral, Dr. Benjamin Carson. Ben, God loves you and so do we. I love being here. And, and we had a wonderful interview the first hour, and you shared with us that you just didn't step into success. You had some real challenging times as a young man in school, didn't you? Uh, things did not go well for me. Uh, in fact, uh, my nickname in class was the dummy. And um, everybody <laughs> liked having me in class, though, because I was what's known as the safety net. No one had to worry about getting the lowest grade as long as I was there. And uh, normally they would put kids like me in the special ed class, but I was a little scrawny kid, so they figured that other special ed kids would kill me, so they left me in the regular class. But uh, I was always creating problems, havoc, uh, trying to get other kids kicked out of the room, uh, telling jokes, because I didn't want other students to achieve either. I knew I wasn't going to achieve, and misery loves company. And that really is the basis of a lot of negative peer pressure, and sometimes our, our young people don't recognize that. But uh, I was just doing absolutely horribly. My mother was horrified. Uh, she was one of 24 children and uh, got married at age 13, moved from Chattanooga, Tennessee with my father to Detroit, found out that he was a bigamist. They got divorced. Uh, we certainly had an opportunity to find out what uh, poverty uh, and disadvantage was all about at that point. But you know, my mother worked two and three jobs at a time as a domestic, didn't want to be on welfare, never considered herself a victim, never felt sorry for herself. And that was a good thing. Problem is, she never felt sorry for us either. So there was never, <laughs> that was the challenge. There was never any excuse that my brother or I could come up with that she would accept. She would always say, do you have a brain? And if the answer was yes, then you could have thought your way out of it. It doesn't matter what anybody else did. And I think that's probably the greatest thing she ever did for us. But um, you know, she just couldn't abide the thought that we were going to have a horrible life because we didn't take advantage of educational opportunities, didn't know what to do and prayed to God for the wisdom to know what to do. And that's the great thing. You don't have to have a PhD to talk to God, just faith. She only had a third grade education. That was enough. God gave her the wisdom. And the wisdom he gave her was to turn off the TV and make us read books and submit to her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> she thought that was wisdom. We thought it was child abuse, but it's just a matter of uh, which way you look at those things. But, you know, she didn't dictate what we had to read so we could read anything we wanted. And, um, you and know, she didn't know what you were reading anyway. She didn't know anyway. She put a check mark on it. But uh, I learned so much, and uh, I got to the point where I enjoyed it because even though we had never money for anything, between the covers of those books, I could go anywhere, I could be anybody, I could do anything. My horizons broadened tremendously within the space of a year and a half. I went from the bottom of the class to the top of the class, much to the consternation of all those kids who used to tease me and call me dummy. Same ones would come to me in the seventh grade and say, Benny, how do you work this problem? And I'd say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. I, was, uh, <laughs> I went overboard a little bit. Uh, by the time I was in the ninth grade, I remember I uh, went up to one of my classmates and said, why do you hate me so much? And he says, because you're so obnoxious. And I said, obnoxious? Moi? You know, I couldn't understand it. He said, you have to have the highest mark in everything. And I began to realize that I was just like the people that I didn't like when I was the dummy. And I decided at that point that maybe the only thing I needed to do was the best that I could do and not worry about anybody else. And that lifted a tremendous burden from my shoulder. And uh, I began to, to really enjoy excelling for the ex sake of excelling and not for comparing myself with anyone else.
Has your mother had the privilege of witnessing your success? Is she still living? My mother lives with us, in fact. Uh, she did teach herself to read eventually. She got her GED. She went off to college in 1994. She got an honorary doctorate degree, so she's Dr. Carson now, too. <laughs> <laughs> I have one brother, Curtis, uh, in Indiana. Uh, he is a uh, mechanical engineer and uh, is a manager in the uh, aircraft landing division uh, of uh, Allied Signal. So did he have the same kind of conversion with the, the removal of the television and the institution of books? Absolutely. Uh, he uh, had the same kinds of emotions, but he also experienced the same, <laughs> the same kinds kind of, of reward. <laughs> every, no question about it. So, and that's good because some people like to say to me, you're a fluke, and then I can point to my brother. And I can point to a zillion other people. You look at all the people, for instance, in the Horatio Alger Society, um, who came from absolutely nowhere, had nothing, and uh, excel in tremendous ways. They all had one thing, though. They had somebody who reached out to them, somebody who encouraged them. It doesn't have to be a mother or father. It can be a friend, it can be a neighbor, it can be a teacher, it can be a minister. But everybody has to have somebody, and, and all of us can be that somebody for someone. Do you think there's a time in someone's life where it's too late to make that change? Uh, I don't think so, as long as a person has a normal brain. Because, first of all, is my belief as a brain surgeon who spends a lot of time dealing with brains, brains that yes. there is no such thing as an ordinary person who has a normal brain. You can do virtually anything. And even when you get older, a lot of older people convince themselves that they can't do anything. They say, I'm too old. That's a bunch of crap. You know, you still have... <laughs> <laughs> you, you still have... Um... You know, this is church. You're not supposed to say that word in church. You know, so. <laughs> Just want to remind you. <laughs> but, you know, even older people, maybe they don't have 100 billion neurons, but they still have 99 billion. And that's plenty to do everything you want to do. The human brain can process more than 2 million bits of information per second. Don't ever let anybody tell you you're too young or too old to do virtually anything. And I'm going to prove that when I retire, because I'm going to become a concert organist. I don't know how to play organ now, but I will one day be back here playing your to organ play as that a organ. So absolutely. That one. Well, we'll keep it. We'll keep it warmed up for you. Yeah. I have another dear friend who's a neurosurgeon, and he said he has told me that he has seen many brains, but he's never seen a mind. That's true. And, uh, and What's the difference? Well, the mind is a spiritual thing. And really, I think that's what separates us from the other creatures that God made. And what that means is that we can plan and strategize. We don't have to react. Animals just react. It's our mind and it's the capability of doing those things that let us actually have control of our lives. So the person who has the most to do with whether we succeed or not is us, and it is not an external force, and it's the choices that we make in life, and that is something that God has given us, and that is something we should never give up.